Hello, my name is Dale Hawthorne. Welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at some red flags which I see, which I call the social behavior of the abuser. Drew Carey had a line in his old TV show back in the 90s about uh, he'd tell someone, uh, you can't take your hang-ups in the road like some sort of psycho carnival. And this is going to be talking about the psycho carnival, which you can find with an abusive person in public or they're not in private with the person they're abusing. So over and over again, I've seen some behavioral patterns, um, both in real life and documented, but I don't know of anywhere that this has been all brought together before. So the truth is, uh, first of all, that they're obsessively controlling vindictive, vindictive people and they act in common ways. But there are others who cooperate with them a lot because they don't recognize that they're participating in a, a wicked web. Um, the term for the literature is that they're fine monkeys. So that's part of it. And uh, the truth is that there's uh, no real pattern to uh, these kind of abusers. It can be men or women. Yeah, women can abuse too. And their targets can be men or women. And they may be spouses, uh, husbands and wives, family members, um, parents and children, and so on. People that at the work or even workplace rivals or life rivals. So these patterns of behavior can take place, again, marital partners, family members, or people with whom there's some sort of social contract, contact or interaction. And so, first of all, the target may be well aware of the abuser's malicious and aggressive intentions and may be avoiding them as much as possible. The uh, person who's the target of the abuse may in fact be going no contact as much as possible even to such actions as changing jobs changing churches changing contact information such as uh, uh, changing telephone numbers email addresses moving away so they may be trying to go no contact as much as possible you'll still see some of these things happening and it's also entirely possible that the abuser is so well practiced so devious and downright sneaky the target may not actually see any of the red flags in front of them. They may all be taking place in the abuser's social interactions with others. And the target may be unaware of the depths of that person's malicious, destructive, and hateful agenda and may not have discerned how deep the, intent, the intentions are. So here are the patterns I've seen documented in the literature some in real life, but again, there are going to be about four, which I'm going to bring together here. And there's another, a fifth one, which I'm going to give a separate video on. Red flag number one, the abusive person talks about his or her targets behind their backs a lot. Again, this may not be entirely something that happens with absolutely everyone, but uh, one of the, this is one of the red flags, one of the tells that this person does have a hateful and destructive agenda against another person. The amount of talking about someone who is not there is one of the easiest markers to discern. And also talking about them with a huge amount of confidence and saying a lot of outrageous things, which uh, um, you may find out that uh, there, there's no warrant for them. The person uh, that they're targeting has a very shallow acquaintance with that person who's doing the abusing. And that uh, abusive person is uh, someone who um, is taking a lot of small things and blowing them up way, way, way out of a turn, out of a proportion. Not um, two and two equals four, but two and two equals 576. Some things like that. So, where the target is not there within earshot, there's the person, the abusive person's favorite top uh, conversation is often the target, and bringing up a lot of lies, a lot of deceit, and no ongoing relationship or all may be possible with the abusive person and the target. And yet the abusive person claims good, wonderful intentions, special closeness and relationship with the targets. And the person who is doing the abusing, uh, the abusive person may mix a grain of truth with a gallon of falsehood and exaggeration about the targets. And uh, when the things that they're saying are exposed as lies, tries to justify it by loudly claiming attention to that grain of truth. And the grain of truth uh, may simply have been offhand remarks taken out of context, small talk, twisted to vicious and belittling extremes, and isolated incidents of things said and done far in the past which bear no resemblance to what the ab abusive person is claiming. So we need to remember 
information about other people has an extremely short shelf life and it may be found to have long past the expiration date of any reasonable validity about another person. And this type of backstabbing and backbiting is often tolerated because the abuser puts on his or her charm and tries to make it as entertaining as possible by trying to present as a joke by mixing it with mockery, ridicule, and even counterfeit compassion. The goal is to isolate the target socially and make the target a recipient of ridicule, contempt, and to isolate the target, as I just mentioned. So uh, it only takes a little bit of scripture. You know, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18 says, He who conceals his hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. Yeah, a fool for living in in God's universe. And where Proverbs 10, 19, next verse says, where words are many, sin is not absent. So this huge amount of talk, this huge amount of things said behind that person's back um, is a real tell. And you can see this also. Um, Psalm 109 is one of the two imprecatory psalms, which uh, imprecatory calling Kurt supposed to be calling a curse down on people. Modern people find 109 and 69 objectionable, but uh, we need to look at this in light of the Old Testament context. The Old Testament uh, told people not to pursue personal vengeance. That's in Leviticus 19, near where the Old Testament verses where it says you will love your neighbor as yourself. But God forbids personal vengeance. And God also condemned and promised justice for the behavior that uh, is brought to him in these psalms. So this is these psalms really need to be seen as an appeal to God where human justice could not provide the redress. And this is what Psalm 109 verses 1 through 5 say. Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. They reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. So continue throughout the whole psalm, and you can look and see that it comes down to one disgruntled person stirring things up with lots of other people. So again, red flag number one, the abusive person talks about his or her targets behind their backs a lot. And a lot of it, when you take a look at it, turns out to be nothing more than... Uh, than deceit. So that's the first red flag. Second red flag, the ap abusive person recruits others to spy on his or her targets. It's amazing how naive and gullible people can be when the abuser seeks to try to get information on his or her targets. The ab abuser s seduces them into being his spies and informants. Yeah, seduction, grooming, to be spies and assortants, uh, informants. And this often accelerates when the target starts to dis distance it from himself or herself from the abuser, when they try to go no contact especially. The spies, the dupes, and the henchmen of the abuser often don't make the connection that the reason that that per target is distancing himself or herself is because they find the abusers to be dishonest, untrustworthy, envious, and cruel. And this is one of the real problems that can happen if you try to go no contact. Abusers recruit spies. And no one that can find in scripture wearing a white hat, the good guys, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Paul, and especially Jesus, ever did anything like this. It's those who wear black hats. Saul, after he turns away, Tobiah, uh, in uh, Nehemiah verse 619, who recruit spies. And also King Ahab, too, recruiting spies, people to go look throughout all the nations for Elijah. So one of the common complaints against the unrighteous in the Psalms is that they engage in this type of spying, gossiping, and recruiting spies on others. And there's no scriptural basis for this type of behavior in either precept or example. The example for the believer, the precept, is to be speaking the truth in love and not to be spying on people and going and bringing stuff out. So along with this comes the next red flag. Red flag number two was abusive person recruits others to spy on his or her targets. Red flag number three goes along with that. The abuser stalks the target from place to place and sometimes for years, even decades. And again, 
this is where a problem if a person tries to go no contact stalking might happen by the most delicious malicious malicious and determined and again king ahab sent messengers in all the nations trying to find elijah and paul's opponent stalked him from church to church so it's a particularly strong red flag and legally in many places across the globe it can be a felony in ohio state where i live right now it's uh, entitled menacing by stalking ohio revised code 2901.211 no person engaging in a pattern of contact conduct shall knowingly cause another person to be believe that the offender will cause physical harm to the other person or cause mental distress to the other person and you know pattern of conduct includes physical harm threat of physical harm mental distress includes any mental illness or condition that, that uh, involves some sub temporary substantial incapacity any mental illness would normally require psychiatric treatment psychological treatment or anything like or whether or not any person requested or received psychiatric treatment psychological treatment or other mental health services so um, that's one statute right there and this kind of behavior is often a characteristic this kind of stalking from place to place recruiting spies is often a characteristic of the obsessive controller or the person who will not let go of a grudge this can happen too um, no grudges should ever be in the body of Christ more than five minutes let alone decades it sometimes happens we should be able to be resolving these things quickly and the person who uh, will not let go of a, a grudge the others in the body of Christ whether they're denominational leaders pastors elders so on um, even women in charge of women's ministries I, one of the churches I served as a pastor there was a woman there who was a single teacher a godly woman and uh, she did have a way of keeping the women with grudges from causing a lot of disruption within that congregation so the kind of person the obsessive controller will often try to get at the target even if the target tries to put some distance between himself and herself and the abuser again this mean would happen if someone's trying to go no contact as much as possible any believer should be aware of anyone that tries to get a group in a church fellowship or any type of ministry situation to try to play tormenting games spying on them mess with his or her mind stalking and this kind of stuff because it's not only unchristlike unscriptural but possibly illegal if it comes under stalking and it may potentially rise to the level of felonious conduct yeah you, you may need to consider calling the law in on some people uh, giving document describe calling the law if it's uh, coming against statutes so that was red flag number three the abuser stalks the target from place to place and sometimes for years or decades red flag number four the abuser makes insinuations against the mental stability of the targets and that's also contained in the statute on stalking in Ohio which I quoted there which is probably contained in other statutes because they they often derive the local statutes from model statutes this is what we call gaslighting the original meaning of the term and it comes from uh, the movie and uh, Jesus was gaslighted um, Mark chapter 3 verses uh, 20 through 21 talks about then Jesus went home and the crowd were gathered again so that they could not even eat and when his family heard it they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind gaslighting Jesus and they gaslighted Paul too at his trial before the Roman governor Festus and uh, uh, King Agrippa II who was uh, kind of like a um, constitutional king but had real, real, no real power over Judea but Paul was brought before him and Paul was talking about giving his uh, testimony things Acts chapter 26 then in four, verses 24 and 25 it says and when he was saying these things in his defense Festus said with a loud voice Paul you're out of your mind your great learning is driving you out of your mind Paul said I'm not out of my mind most excellent Festus I'm speaking true and rational words so yeah it's entirely possible to do, to say if someone is doing this to claim to assert 
strongly, firmly, and calmly that you were not crazy. So, I've got a quote here from a book uh, by E. Fuller Torrey, who's one of the premier psychiatrists of the day and nowadays. He literally wrote the book on schizophrenia and uh, bipolar mental disorder. And he speaks about how there is no question that calling a person mentally ill is pejorative. A more serious consequence of the belief that mental patients, and he puts it in quotes because he thinks that uh, there may be some cases where people are treated as mental patients where they're perfectly sane, not any, any of the um, degrees which causes psychotic breaks and is not responsible is the entry that it provides for discrediting others thoughts and achievements yeah calling someone crazy yeah discrediting your thoughts and achievements their versions of events since mental patients again his quotes are not responsible then everyone who can be successfully labeled as mentally ill his quotes are mentally ill can be ignored depreciated or even ridiculed so that's what one of the things which uh, an abuser will try to do with gaslighting so false or any accusations of mental illness or instability by abusers are one of the most common markers that the abuser is pursuing some malicious and vindictive uh, agenda and when people hear these things so often they really don't consider how eminently unqualified the abusers are to make such allegations and amateur diagnoses and the abusers may throw out labels which say uh, really don't understand very well, but they, they're pretending to have a sophisticated understanding of mental illness. And some of these people, creeps haven't even finished college. They haven't, they barely made it through high school and they're doing this. And this works for a little while because they know that others may not understand the labels that they're throwing out. It will not take the trouble to verify what the abuser is actually saying. So, why do they do this? Well, Gaslighting, it's a police term originally. And uh, the first reason is that the um, target may be going through uh, some life crisis, may be suffering in some way. So if a person is suffering, if they've lost someone in their lives, if they had some unemployment, lost relationship, the death of a relative or a life crisis, that's not mental illness. That's a response to the normal things which come across to us in our lives. It's not mental instability. But if those happen in someone's life, it's entirely possible that an abuser who has an agenda against them, that they will find that fits in that abuser's campaign to isolate and torment the target and exploit the times of suffering to deepen the misery they want to inflict on that target. And it's also possible that alleged mental illness and instability of the target can be had sadness, hurt, and avoidance from that long suffering caused by the abuser. And uh, some psychiatrists have come to the conclusion that uh, some sufferers of depression are simply in prolonged abusive relationships and medicating them for depression amounts to anesthetizing the victim of the abuse. And the cute need is to bring that person out of that relationship and the person in that situation the person who actually is demonstrating mental instability is the abuser so legally you can also find in gaslighting situations that there may be some crimes being committed not only physical abuse but other crimes being committed behind the scenes so that's why it becomes a police term too so a person who goes on no contact who starts to have some time of separation starts to get visibly nor more normal may alert the others around them to the reality of the abuse that's been taking place so it's logical to inquire very pointedly about the qualifications and the reasoning of anyone who makes any insinuations about the mental stability of any adult who's not been professionally diagnosed is not under professional care for a reasonably um, reasonable diagnosis especially of some sort of psychosis and upon honest examination those type of insinuations will simply be found to be slander and gaslighting and uh, 
even if the person may be go undergoing some kind of professional care, put a, that should be put a stop to it. Oop. Construction noise outside. Because sometimes gaslighting is an attempt to over to uh, sabotage legitimate efforts by a target to overcome past difficulties and suffering. And the abuser wants that person to continue to suffer, to be in misery. And this behavior can have severe legal consequences for the abuser, with the consequences spelled out in statutes on slander, libel, and stalking, and uh, dealing with uh, someone's uh, counseling, psychotherapy, or something like that, in a, in a way which is uh, not, you're not keeping confidences. So, comes down to also, as believers, let's keep our personal responsibility for God. If we cover our sins, we will not prosper, but if we confess and forsake them, we'll find mercy. That's Proverbs 28, 13. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our own sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It may be sometimes if we're finding ourselves a target. Maybe enough sometimes to point out the rudeness because it is often extraordinarily rude and people ignore the rudeness because um, they're just passive. They just let this go on around them. And uh, the person who's doing the abuse doesn't want their fabrications and misrepresentations contradicted. And if you try to discourage what they're saying, their lies, their rudeness, and uh, maybe even trying to boss you around, control you in front of others, they may become even more vehement. But again, you need to come put it back on them. Their own misbehavior is front and center from other people at that point. And if it's occurring within a church, you may need to seriously consider leaving that church. If the church is tolerating this type of behavior towards anyone. So... I don't want to say that, you know, well, um, I know it's a hard choice to make it because if you start to come into a fellowship with the church and find that there are people there you love and love you back and you find that there's someone who's trying to make a target of you, you for abuse, you may need to really seriously consider that. And especially, and this does happen, sometimes pastors are this way too. Most of the pastors I know are men who are trying and uh, we're trying to be godly as they can, preach the word of God. And there goes the construction noise again. But I would say, if a pastor is engaging that type of behavior, we may need to leave that church. So there's some other videos I'm going to have next video, a free, maybe not the next one, but a future one. We're talking about red flag number five. The abuser assumes a, and exercises authority in a satanic and not a Christ-like manner, and that's a symptom that they've given in to a temptation to power and control and it's become a satanic stronghold within that person's life. Three main um, temptations for a pastor. Money, sex, and power. So that um, this is one of those cases where it becomes a satanic stronghold. So that's what I got to say. I hope it becomes is helpful to you. I find things in here which you can work with. Um, I'm going to have some more um, videos on this. I do have a number of notes which I have over the years. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. God bless you and may you find yourself in a situation where you're being loved and loving others as Christ has loved you. So, thank you.